Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. Four Ontario school boards are taking the biggest social media giants to court, suing them for billions of dollars. They are claiming that apps like TikTok and Instagram are designed in a way that is negatively rewiring the way children think and behave, and that this has become alarmingly evident in the classroom. Dale Manukduk reports. The Toronto District School Board, the Toronto Catholic Board, the Peel District School Board and the Ottawa Carleton Board are suing social media giants like Meta who own Facebook and Instagram, ByteDance who own TikTok and Snapchat. They say that these companies built products purposely that are addictive and negatively impacting the mental health outcomes of young people. We're seeing behavioral outbursts in students uh, at much more alarming rates. Um, this has been rising. It's becoming more intense. All four boards filed a statement of claim to Ontario's Superior Court. In it, the boards claimed the defendants, the tech companies and social media platforms negligently interfered with mandates to promote student achievement and well-being and that they negligently designed unsafe or addictive products and market them to students. Nine out of ten of our students indicate that they're on social media daily with almost half of those on social media for five hours or more. Each board is suing for different amounts. The damages being sought totals over $4.5 billion, with the TDSB seeking the most at $1.6 billion. I'm actually okay with the idea of the lawsuit because I think the evidence has become more and more clear that there's a problem. Social media is a really difficult thing for students to navigate and um, that these companies need to be held accountable for the way that they've transformed childhood. That's a lot of adults talking, but maybe parents just don't understand. I don't need somebody telling me what I can or cannot consume. I think that's up to me to choose. I don't see how it's really affecting me negatively if I still succeed in school. I don't know if it's worth suing. I feel like it's more of a personal problem. And while these students don't think a lawsuit is a great idea, they do admit the platforms are addictive. How often are you on these platforms? All the time. <laughs> All the time. But in classes that are important, of course I'm not. Probably like eight hours. Probably three hours a day, more or less, three, four. I looked on mine, it was like 10 hours, like 41 minutes or something. It's really bad. Do you find these products to be addictive at all? Yes, very. Super. Yeah, yeah. It's super addictive. I gotta go now. They were also aware of the potential harms of social media. Like body image maybe, like, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. There's a lot of um, like models that are on social media posting their bodies, which is making younger girls feel more insecure about themselves. Well, there's definitely like some really messed up trends. I know that's happened in the past where like there's like people harming themselves and things like that. And some people get influenced by it. But there are guardrails in place in the school, at home and with Internet providers. The Wi-Fi already doesn't allow like TikTok on it, so we can't even watch it. They only allow like Snapchat and Instagram. I don't go on it without my parents' permission and they have certain rules and they have certain things on routers that like cut down screen time. My parents have always been I don't want to say strict but relatively restrictive of it and they've taken good measures for me to be safe on the internet which I'm honestly really grateful for. Like those students the premier isn't in favor of the lawsuit calling it nonsense. Let's focus on uh, math and reading and writing uh, that's what we need to do, put all the resources into the kids. Um, and I don't know, what are they spending on lawyer fees to go after these massive companies that have endless cash to uh, fight this? While the boards are seeking a lot of money and damages, the lawyer representing them says a successful outcome would be change. Meaningful change, change to the nature of the algorithmic designs underlying these products, change to the age restrictions associated with them, change to the parental controls. Snapchat tells us it feels good about the role it plays in keeping people connected. TikTok is touting its parental controls and the restrictions to age on its app. We haven't heard back from Meta's Facebook or Instagram. All of them will have 20 days to file a statement of defense depending on when or where they were served. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. One of the most popular musicals of all time is back on the Toronto stage. The latest production of Les Miserables opened at the Princess of Wales Theatre this week. And tonight, the stars of the show are walking the red carpet. Anam Khan joins us live from outside the theatre. Anam, lots of excitement for the show, which first came to Toronto 35 years ago.
Yes, Kelda, the show wrapped up not too long ago. There's lots of really excited audience members who many of them came here for the first time. And you know, the show first came to Toronto in 1989. And it has been here numerous times after that, but not in the last decade. So there has been a lot of excitement. Princess of Wales Theatre buzzing with excitement, with the much-awaited musical returning to Toronto for the seventh time. Les Miserables. It's just it stirs the soul. It's, yes, it brings yeah. so much emotion up to, yeah. Yeah, up to the surface. It's and beautiful. we're like, it's OG theatre. He needs yeah. to... I've never seen this yeah. one. So I was very excited to come and see a show that I've been hearing about for like 20 years. And there was lots of glitz and glam tonight, with the principal cast taking on the red carpet promoting a musical about love, redemption, and survival of the human spirit set in 19th century France. It's about people fighting to make their life better. And if there's anything that I feel our audiences can connect with, it's that story, but it's also this music. It really is, it's, it's goosebump inducing uh, music, which is wonderful. Cosette is kind of the adopted daughter of our principal, Jean Valjean. And um, she's basically symbolizes hope in a very, in dark times um, in the French Revolution. She kind of comes on as this ray of light and this symbol of hope and excitement excitement about the future. I like about my character is that he's very funny, charismatic, he's confident, he's brave, he's outgoing, just like me. And yeah, I really feel like I could relate to him. I had a dream my life would be. The show's last run in Toronto was in 2013, also here at Princess Wales Theatre. I think that there's generation after generation who still has not seen it. And 155,000 people We'll see it in the next 10 weeks. Like many theater goers, David Mirish says he's seen the musical numerous times and it's never enough. I think it's because it's full of hope. It takes all the way to the end of the story for us to realize that if we persist, hopefully justice and safety and home and individuals will all survive and good will triumph. And so that hope is something that's important to all of us. And as a show, when it first started, I think it echoed the history of many countries, even Canada. Tonight's show bringing out some well-known faces from the city, including Raptor Scotty Barnes, Mayor Olivia Chow, and Law & Order Toronto actress Karen Robinson. I, it is such an impression on me when I see people who have that immense talent of being able to act and sing and dance all at the same time. I am always just so humbled by that. It's, it's a particular sensation, musical theater. I, I enjoy it completely. Kelda, so the show is not sold out yet, but tickets are selling out fast. And I was speaking to the cast members, and they've come here from across North America. Many of them are here in Toronto for the first time. So the excitement goes both ways. Yeah, I just might have to get tickets. Thanks so much, Anam. That's our Anam Khan live. Welcome back. You may once again be able to kick back with a nice cold one in the park this summer. The city's Economic and Community Development Committee approved a recommendation from city staff today to allow alcohol in some city parks following a successful pilot project last summer. As Chris Glover reports, if passed by council next month, drinking in parks will be here to stay. I'm sure you, your friends, were also drinking in parks even before all of this. <laughs> No comment. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Just tea and coffee in these cups at Trinity Bellwoods Park, but these friends are in favor of allowing alcohol in more Toronto parks. We live in such small quarters that I feel like if it's in a safe environment and you're doing it safely, I think it's totally fine. <laughs> For two months last year, drinking was allowed in 27 parks. A staff report found more than 90% of people surveyed were satisfied. The kind of catastrophes that were predicted didn't happen. There were no raves, there were no keggers, there were no large police presence in any park. Councillor Paula Fletcher now pushing for an expansion to more parks, especially since no tickets were handed out and 311 complaints only minimally increased. We're meant to patrol these when we're in the area, but we are, we're not dedicated, we are not on scene at all times uh, because there haven't been issues. Having washrooms, fountains, and a size of 1.5 hectares are specific requirements city staff are recommending for the expansion. 
Staff also recommend drinking not be allowed within two meters of playgrounds, not at outdoor pools and not at the waterfront. I don't want her to be exposed to that, um, uh, drinking and stuff like that. I just don't think that that's the place if you wanted to go drinking. While some still have concerns, not everybody. People tend to do it very responsibly. Opting for a book over a beer, Asher Jones still can't understand why it's taking so long. Obviously, the drinking policies in places like Europe, it's a lot more free. Um, so it's interesting to see it taking this long here. But York Centre Councillor James Pasternak said in a statement he won't support it. We have enough problems with alcohol and substance abuse and underage drinking. The last thing the city should be doing is creating an environment that makes it easier. But city staff also recommended expanding alcohol to at least one park in each ward with the local councillor's approval. Shouldn't everybody have that ability somewhere in their ward to go to a park and have a nice beer? Councillor Fletcher says no councillor should be able to stand in the way and will continue pushing for that as the idea winds its way to full council. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. The city's Rent Safe TO program is looking to increase the number of building inspections in an effort to enforce health and safety standards. But some renters in Thorncliffe Park are skeptical the new efforts will improve conditions for tenants. Olivia Bowden has more as part of CBC Toronto's Communities in Focus initiative. This renter snaps photos of his building, 71 Thorncliffe Park Drive. He's lived there with his family for 18 years, but he says the apartment's conditions have been poor. CBC Toronto is protecting his identity due to fears his landlord will retaliate. Once you're inside the unit, you don't feel you're living in a first world country. When I was in India, it's like, wow, it's going to be good. You know, but when you come here and you're inside the unit, you don't feel you're living in Canada. The city does have a program to tackle poor rental conditions. It's called Rent Safe TO. It enforces the city's bylaws around health and safety standards. Rent Safe inspects buildings and scores them based on different criteria, such as pests and infrastructure. The changes rolling out this year include more frequent and in-depth evaluations, and consequences can include fines for building owners. But the renter says so far, Rent Safe hasn't helped conditions, including garbage piling up and poor maintenance. The garbage chutes uh, are in a very bad shape. They're always full every night. And he's not the only Thorncliff renter with concerns. Multiple tenants told CBC Toronto their buildings are infested with mice and cockroaches, and that they've given up on complaining to landlords because the problems don't get fixed. The local legal clinic says fines aren't enough. There is a lack of enforcement or teeth that they, the city has. And in the end, the tenants suffer because nothing is getting done. But the Rent Safe TO team says they are holding landlords to the law. We do have tools in our toolbox to take the necessary steps. Carlton Grant says they have doled out fines. They even have the option to fix the buildings themselves, charging the costs back to the landlord on their taxes. But the city hasn't resorted to the highest fines they can issue, up to $100,000. The two fines issued last year were both for $15,000. And the legal clinic says that's not enough to keep landlords in check. What's the point of having this program if there's no fear on the part of landlords to actually abide by it? The legal clinic is now advising tenants to organize their complaints and take them to the city together. Olivia Bowden, CBC News, Toronto. Easter is one of the busiest times of the year for chocolatiers, but this year they're also feeling the pinch. Cocoa prices across the globe are rising rapidly. So while shop owners deal with the Easter chocolate rush, they're also considering ways they may have to adapt their businesses. Telia Ricci has more. At this quaint shop in the junction, each of these chocolates are handmade from start to finish. And the husband and wife team behind Delight Chocolate and Ice Cream wouldn't have it any other way. I love getting creative with flavors and um, the art. But recently, Toronto chocolatiers like them have also had to get creative about how to keep their businesses thriving. In the past year, we had, we've witnessed about four price increases on our main product, which is chocolate, smaller, percentages, five or ten percent, but we've been told by our supplier as of next month 
that it will go up as much as 50 percent. That's something they haven't experienced in the 20 years of running the business. We had a lot of conversations trying to figure out what we would do, what we could change. According to the International Cocoa Organization, the daily price for cocoa on March 24, 2023 was around $2,700 U.S. per tonne. One year later, that number has jumped to more than $9,000 U.S. per tonne, and there isn't really any sign that these increases are going to slow down. Chocolate-producing regions of the world like Ghana and Ivory Coast are coping with climate change. There's also a push from cocoa farmers for better livable wages. The idea that the chocolate um, prices are going up right now is actually symbolic of several years of really tough environment, uh, environmental conditions in those locations. There will be landholders who switch crops entirely, who will lose their livelihoods because of this, and other uh, folks will need to take up the mantle to grow it in other places. But because of that, there will be a delay where these old trees are in places where they can't produce food and the new trees are planted, but they're not yet producing fruits. So we needed to keep um, offering good quality of chocolate, but also make the changes. So it's something that we are already expecting one day we'll come with this big chunk of increase. At Mary's Brigadero, the Easter bunnies are smaller this year, but people are still buying them. Marianne Oliveira says as local chocolate makers like her adapt their businesses, the hope is that the customers stick around. I would say keep looking for the big picture. Right now, as small business owners, they support other people. In our case, we support other women, other immigrants who work with us. Uh, and right now, the way that I see, let's keep sharing moments of happiness and joy. A sentiment shared by Jeff and Jennifer, who uh, say sure. while customers may notice a difference in their prices, they've decided that the recipes and their commitment to being fair trade and organic will remain the same. We're just going to have to raise our prices. We won't have a choice in the matter. So we're not going to compromise on our, our core product. So if they've come to know us for the chocolates that they love, the, the recipes are not going to change. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. The Easter long weekend is upon us and the roads are expected to be busy over the next few days as people visit friends and family. And with that in mind, the OPP is launching their latest safety campaign with a focus on seat belts. Greg Ross has those details. Put that seatbelt on. OPP spokesperson Carrie Schmidt says whether you're driving or a passenger, you need to buckle up. He says OPP investigators have determined that at least 67 people who died in crashes last year would have likely survived if they were wearing a seatbelt. He says they've seen almost 300 cases like this in the last five years. The lack of seatbelt was the primary contributing factor in that person's death. And that's why we are uh, making this a, a serious priority. He says if you're not buckled in, it's not only your life you're putting at risk. If that vehicle begins to tumble and roll, that uh, occupant now becomes a projectile and can cause serious damage and trauma to other people that are buckled up. You are behind the front seat. Schmidt says last year the OPP issued more than 10,000 charges for seatbelt related offenses. But it's not just seatbelts they'll be looking for this weekend. They'll also be watching for dangerous drivers and impaired drivers. We're going to be doing uh, ride campaigns as well. We have seen a consistent increase in impaired driving occurrences over the last five years. Impaired driving is not the only thing trending upwards in recent years. They've also seen an increase in fatalities on Ontario roads over the Easter long weekend. Last year, over the Easter long weekend, five people lost their lives in road crashes across the province. The year before that, we had four fatalities. The year before that, we had three fatalities. So we're going in the wrong direction. Some good news for commuters in the Toronto area this weekend. They're going to be pausing construction that began this week on the Gardner Expressway, meaning all lanes are expected to be open all weekend. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. And you are looking at a live shot of Toronto, partly cloudy tonight and sitting at seven degrees. Colette Kennedy joins us now with a first look with a look at your forecast. Now, Colette, nice to see the sun out today. Hoping we get some more of that as we head into the long weekend. Yeah, Kelda, it is always very important when we're moving into a holiday weekend, the forecast, a lot of pressure here, uh, but things are looking pretty good in terms of what we can expect. I want to give you an overview. Uh, first of all, our temperatures close to seasonal, meaning they might be a degree or two over or below in most cases 
a degree or so below, but uh, pretty close to where they should be for this time of year. We do have some clouds that are going to move through on Friday and a chance of showers, especially for southwestern Ontario through Saturday. So I'm going to walk you through that. Now, some of that may spill into the GTA later in the day on Saturday. Our daytime highs today, again, sort of where we've been at, close to where we're going to be for the next few days in terms of these numbers. Uh, just a slight bit cooler around the Golden Horseshoe. So overnight tonight, minus two. Now, the wind's back off, but it's still enough to give a bit of a wind chill. So feeling like minus six, if you were up early this morning, like I was walking the dog, there was a crispness in the air and you're going to feel that again early tomorrow morning. Uh, seven into the afternoon, I do have the increase in cloudiness. It actually shouldn't be that bad. Uh, so a lot of sun early and then just we'll get some pockets of cloud kind of coming through into the afternoon and the winds will pick back up a little bit. A slim chance of a wet flurry, especially to the north. And I'll show you what I mean here. We do have a trough of low pressure kind of moving through or over top of us there's that patch of cloud that wants to come in and just through that is where we could see an isolated highly isolated flurry that's Friday now let's go towards Saturday this system pulling in may bring in fact some significant rainfall into southwestern Ontario and perhaps if it moves just a little further north a glancing blow also into the GTA with a bit of wet weather. Uh, it is mostly a rain event. Some mixing could happen though Saturday night into Sunday morning. Wet flurries even into the city possible. Uh, a look at some of those numbers in terms of the rainfall and this is why I think it's going to be juicier uh, there back towards Windsor, Chatham Kent, perhaps even towards London and up towards Sarnia. Temperatures overnight tonight. Some cool readings. A little bit better once again into eastern Ontario. And here we go on Friday that high of seven degrees with some of that increase in cloudiness for Good Friday. And then on Saturday, late in the day, we get into that chance of showers. But of course, that's for Toronto. Keeping in mind, back towards Windsor, you will be seeing some rain coming on through. Helda. Thanks so much, Colette. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. And a reminder, there will be no newscasts on Good Friday. Have a great weekend, everyone.